Okay, let us begin the last academic session of the day. But before I begin this topic on superconductivity, uh, I want to make a mention a point. I am going to be talking about what are known as conventional superconductors. Uh, there are two reasons why I would not touch what are known as high temperature superconductors. Um, the first and the foremost is that uh, I am not knowledgeable about uh, high temperature superconductors. The second and which is probably a more appropriate reason is that uh, theoretically high temperature superconductors are not yet properly understood. There are no standard theories. There have been certain theories but no standard theories as yet. And being a theoretical physicist, I found uh, understanding um, high temperature superconductors is not my cup of tea as yet. So what we will do however is in the December session, we will get some people working on high temperature superconductors to give you a talk on there. So my talk will be entirely restricted to uh, the what are known as the conventional superconductors, which in principle uh, actually were discovered back in 1911. So therefore, uh, what I am talking about is not really modern physics. Uh, in 1911, the Dutch physicist Kamerling Ohns, uh, he was uh, uh, essentially looking at low temperature behavior of mercury. You know, he wanted to solidify mercury. And as he went doing this, you know, I mean, he was looking at uh, various physical properties that the mercury had as the temperature was decreased. Now, what he found is that when the temperature dropped below 4.15 Kelvin, in fact, uh, incidentally, he was the person who was working on reduction of temperature also. So, as the temperature went to 4.15 degrees, solid mercury suddenly lost any vestige of resistivity that it had. And uh, from then started the whole uh, subject of uh, superconductivity as we understand it. Uh, it was not until something like 40 to 50 years later uh, that people tried to even have a theory of uh, the conventional superconductors. The Bardeen, Cooper and Schiffer uh, provided the uh, necessary theory which is still the standard theory of conventional superconductors uh, for which Bardeen, uh, Cooper and Schiffer were given a Nobel Prize and in fact uh, Bardeen is the only person to have received two Nobel Prizes in physics. There have been other people who have received two Nobel Prizes but never uh, in physics. Uh, usually they have been in different subjects. Uh, but of course, there is one person who has received two Nobel Prizes in chemistry, uh, but we are not discussing chemistry here. Okay. So, yes. Kamerling only we have got two Nobel Prizes. No, 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 no. One two, liquefying element. No, the only person to have received two Nobel Prizes in physics is Bardeen. Okay. One for uh, discovery of superconductor or theory of superconductivity. Other one, he shared a Nobel Prize with uh, Bratton and Shockley for discovery of transistor. Okay? There is a, another gentleman whose name is Sanger who received two Nobel Prizes in chemistry. Okay? There have been other people like for example, Madame Curie got two Nobel Prizes but one in physics, one in chemistry, not in the same subject. History, there are only two people who have received two Nobel Prizes in the same discipline. Linus Pauling got it in chemistry and peace but let us not discuss history of Nobel Prize. Okay. Uh, so the, let us look at the phenomenology of superconductivity. What are the basic things that we understand about superconductivity? Now, one is uh, vanishing of DC resistance of a sample. As the, as the temperature goes down to a uh, temperature which we call today as the critical temperature, the resistance of the sam sample become zero. Now, I, I want to make this point very clear because uh, this, this seems to be very well misunderstood. It is not that resistance has become vanishingly small, but is still there. Okay? The resistance has actually become zero. It is conducting 
uh, electricity without any resistance. Okay, and and the thing is, of course, it has to be verified experimentally. Today, the verification is to one part in ten to the power fifteen that the resistance is actually equal to zero. So DC resistance of the sample uh, goes, and um, uh, most of these, okay, uh, are behave like an ordinary metal uh, above DC. And uh, for example, now this way you are talking about when there is no external magnetic field applied. And uh, well, AC resistance also remains zero up to a critical frequency. A much better test of whether something is a superconductor or not is not what is its resistance, because uh, of the reason that I will explain to you just now. Um, a much better test of a superconducting phenomena is an effect known as Meissner effect. The Meissner effect essentially says that a superconductor does not allow flux to enter the specimen. Now, actually this problem is lot more serious than that. Is superconductor a perfect conductor which obeys electrodynamics laws? Of laws? The answer is no. And I will just explain why there is a difference between superconductor and what you can call as a perfect conductor. A perfect conductor is something which where my uh, conductivity is infinite or the resistivity is zero. So let us look at what is this difference. So suppose I am looking at a perfect conductor. Now one of the things which we have done that we know that we have a Faraday's law which says del cross of E is equal to dB by dt with a minus sign. Now, if I have a perfect conductor, right, then um, I would have sigma going to infinity, which means since the current must remain finite, the electric field is rigorously equal to zero for a perfect conductor. Now, if the electric field is zero, the curl of that is also zero. Now, if the curl of that is 0, by Maxwell's equation, that curl of E equal to minus dB by dt, it tells me dB by dt is 0. If dB by dt is 0, then B is constant. Is this clear? So, a consequence of perfect conductivity, perfect conductivity is that B must remain constant. Now, let us look at that problem in the following way. Suppose I take a metal at an ordinary temperature, it is not a superconductor, ordinary metal and I do the following thing, I apply a magnetic field, I subject this metal to a magnetic field. The magnetic lines of forces will obviously penetrate the sample. So the picture that I would have will be something like this. Okay. Now what you do is this, that suppose you now reduce the temperature, suppose you now reduce the temperature at a particular temperature T below Tc, the substance will become a superconductor, clear? But I have just now said B field must remain the same because dB by dt equal to 0 means B equal to constant. Now in this case you notice there was B inside the specimen. And as you reduce the temperature, the flux was expelled out of the system. So what I am trying to tell you is that supposing you take a superconductor and subject it to a magnetic field, the magnetic field will not penetrate that sample, understand all. But having a metal at a normal temperature, subject it to a magnetic field so that the magnetic lines of forces penetrate the sample. And now you reduce the temperature, I expect according to the Maxwell's equation, the magnetic field B to be constant. But the magnetic field B is not constant, but is exactly equal to zero again. So therefore, a superconductor not only does not allow any flux to get inside it, if it is in a superconducting state, if any magnetic flux was already within it, 
on becoming a super superconductor those fluxes will be expelled out and it is the second thing which is against the dictates of the maxwell's equation because maxwell's equation says b must remain constant so therefore perfect conductivity is not the test of superconductivity meissner effect which says that superconductors are perfect diamagnets they don't allow you know what is the diamagnet you remember the cause of diamagnetism is basically lenz's law which says if you have a changing magnetic flux you um, there will be an um, equivalent electric induced electric field and this electric field will oppose the changing in the flux that you are trying to make perfect diamagnet means that the current is strong enough that it doesn't allow any flux change to happen inside so meissner effect is a statement that superconductor is a perfect diamond now another interesting consequence comes there of supposing i have taken a metal which has a hole in it now the metal has a hole in it i subject it to a magnetic field now when i subject it to a magnetic field the magnetic lines of forces they not only uh, go penetrate the sample but a part of it is also go through the hole in the circuit now suppose now i reduce the temperature now when the this ring becomes a superconductor of course this now what do you do is it becomes a superconductor the flux will be expelled out now this fluxes which will be expelled out part of it will remain because nothing can stay within the specimen so the magnetic field lines which were closer to the outer edge of the sample they will go outside they will be expelled outside those which were closer to the inner edge of the sample they will simply go to the hole they will simply go to the hole and now i do something else i withdraw the magnetic field now if i withdraw the magnetic field these flux lines have to go to infinity right the magnetic field vanishes but in order that the flux lines can go to infinity there is no other way for them other than to traverse through the material of the sample and the ring being superconductor is not going to allow it so in other words this flux which were put into the hole when the material was superconducting but there was a magnetic field on withdrawal of the magnetic field those flux lines get permanently trapped okay you don't have a magnetic field but the flux flux lines are there obviously they will close on themselves but they can't go to infinity they are closing on themselves and the quantum of flux is known to be uh, in the units of hc over 2e it is this 2e instead of e which had originally you know been an indicator of that it's always the electronic charge comes in pairs there and we'll see why as you go along okay now the point is this that suppose i have a superconductor at a temperature t less than tc now of course i can increase the temperature and destroy the superconductor but i can do something else i keep the temperature the same and i apply a magnetic field the increase in temperature destroys superconductivity but so does application of a magnetic field as you apply a magnetic field there would be a particular value of the magnetic uh, field strength hc at which the superconductivity will go away now if the value of the magnetic field that you have to apply to remove the superconductivity at a temperature t equal to 0 is hc 0 then the field that you have to apply at different temperatures has a dependence on temperature as 1 minus t square by tc square obviously if t is equal to tc you don't need any 
magnetic field to destroy superconductivity. The other thing is, so most of the elemental superconductors, typical examples being mercury, lead, tin, niobium, they are, they follow this principle. That is, you apply a magnetic field at a given temperature when they are superconductor, and as you go on, increase the strength of the magnetic field, you will find a um, limiting value or a particular critical value of the field, critical field at which the superconductivity will vary. Now, such material, they are known as type 1 superconductor. Type 1 superconductors are those where the uh, magnetic field uh, destroys superconductivity in this fashion. There are many alloys. There are many alloys which um, have a slightly different behavior. And that behavior is given by this expression. They are called type 2 superconductors. Now in type 2 super, remember I, I maintain that Meissner effect is the test of superconductivity. And what is Meissner effect? No magnetic flux should be permitted to enter a specimen. Now what we do is this, that these materials, you keep it at a particular temperature and you increase the magnetic field. Now you will find that as you increase the magnetic field, okay, when, so below a particular value, the material remains a superconductor. But when it exceeds a value, value which I call as HC1, what you find is there is some expulsion of flux, but it is incomplete expulsion of flux. Remember that we said Meissner effect says that on becoming a superconductor or, or become superconductor doesn't allow anything to get in. So what we are talking about is this, that I am coming from that side that if the strength is large enough, which we will call as HC2, the material will become a normal metal. But if it is not large enough, but greater than some value HC1, but less than that value HC2, then what one finds is there is expulsion of flux, but there is a partial expulsion of flux. This can be called as a mixed state. The reason I cannot go into, because what happens there is, certain tubes of fluxes, they actually can enter the specimen. And these have been also known as vortex state. What happened to the current between HC1 and HC2? That's a mixed state. So therefore, the, the, it remains partly superconducting. Okay? The, see, it is basically a, a situation in which I have a superconductor. I told you that the current is not a test that I'm looking at. Okay? That, it, it is partly a superconductor because its uh, resistance is fairly low. But th that is totally immaterial to me. I am looking at does it expel magnetic flux or not. Okay. The next property which is of importance is, I have only talked about properties which are important in our discussion, is if you look at the specific heat of a superconductor. You remember specific heat of a metal. Specific heat of a metal uh, has two components. Uh, the extreme low temperature, it is linear in temperature T. But there is a, you know, if it is not that low, then there is also a lattice contribution which goes as TQ. You must have done that several times for your student, that linear in T plus TQ due to phonons. So I'm not talking about phonons at all. I'm talking about only electronic contribution which takes place at extremely low temperature. So I expect for a normal metal, for a normal metal, the behavior of the specific heat, the electronic part of the specific heat to be a straight line. Higher temperature side is this side. Now what happens is this is the normal specific heat. Now as you reduce the temperature, the substance becomes a superconductor. What is found is, that this specific heat suddenly jumps to a higher value, almost factor of 3. But after that, as the temperature 
decreases further. It doesn't follow a straight line, but follow an exponentially decaying behavior. And the specific behavior is, goes like this, that is e to the power minus delta by 2 kt. Now, this reminded people of the fact that the specific heat for semi-metals, if you like, also had this type of behavior. And exponential behavior of the specific heat, the delta there is what is normally called as the activation energy in case of semi-metals. That's the minimum amount of energy that the electrons has to overcome in order to go to the conduction line. And so therefore, this behavior that it is exponentially decaying was already known in a different context. And it was known that the material where the specific heat decays exponentially, that happens because in the energy spectrum, in their electronic energy spectrum, there is a gap. There is a gap between the filled states and the nearest unoccupied state to which the electrons must be promoted in order that they can carry entropy and things like that. So this was our indication that the superconducting spectrum had a gap. A typical energy gap is not very large. Typical energy gap is a few milli electron volts. And that is the reason why superconductivity gets easily destroyed at very low temperature. Because as you know, the room temperature is just about 25 milli electron volts. And we are talking about energy gaps which are much less, typically, you know, few uh, single digit values. So this is what we talked about, that um, um, the, if a superconducting uh, specimen is subjected to an electromagnetic field, these uh, uh, photons or whatever uh, electrons or whatever is there, you need a minimum energy of 2 delta, and I will come to why you need 2 delta, in order to overcome the energy gap. Now, this 2 delta became very important. See, if there is an energy gap of delta, then you expect that is the amount of energy I will require in order to overcome the barrier. But you see, what is happening there is this, that if a photon is absorbed and overcomes an energy gap delta, in this picture that we have, the, I have to break it up into two electrons and not one electron. Because our state is very funny. Here, there is a pairing of two electrons, and which we'll come to a little later. These were known as the Cooper pairs. So um, only when H nu exceeds two times the energy gap, the breaking up of the Cooper pair will be possible. Because the Cooper pairs absorb that amount of energy, and then only they can be separated. Okay, let's go through some elementary theories now. First is there are two or three theories, a couple of them fairly elementary, and after that, of course, BCS theory, which is the most important theory. First is superconducting transition is obviously reversible. I can decrease the temperature, it becomes a superconductor, increase the temperature, it becomes a metal again, OK? And uh, I'm talking only about type 1 superconductors. Type 2 is a lot more difficult to understand. So in type 1 superconductor, so let me write down what is the Gibbs free energy. You all know the expression for the Gibbs free energy. So Gibbs free energy is uh, your U minus Ts. There is a PV term, but of course, since our PV terms remains the same on superconducting and normal side, I have not written it unnecessarily. And suppose I have applied a magnetic field. If I apply a magnetic field, in addition to the U minus Ts term, the Gibbs free energy will pick up a term like G H times M. That's the energy in the magnetic field. So my change in the energy U, du, is given by Tds plus Hdm. So if you substitute there, you find that dg 
is S D T minus mu times M D H. Okay. Now, if I have a perfect diamagnet, then B is equal to zero. Therefore, M is equal to minus H. Remember that for a perfect diamagnet, the susceptibility is minus one. Now, in that case, I can get an expression by integrating this of the Gibbs free energy as a function of the applied magnetic field. So, Gibbs free energy as a function of the magnetic field is some GS0 plus mu h square by 2. This is the same as b square by 2 mu if you are using b. Okay. So, that is the energy of the system in the when it is in superconducting state. Now, supposing I want to find out the when will the two phases, the normal phase and the superconductive phase will be in equilibrium. I know at temperature Tc, the two phases are in equilibrium. So, when my temperature or, or alternatively at any given temperature, if I apply a magnetic field of strength Hc, the superconductivity will be destroyed, it will go to a normal state. So, therefore, normal state is in equilibrium with a superconducting state at h equal to hc. So, therefore, my normal state gives free energy is given by the same expression with g s 0 which is uh, this one plus mu h c square by 2. So, you notice this what we are trying to say is the normal state gives free energy minus the superconducting state gives free energy is equal to the energy extra energy that you need to supply in order to destroy superconductivity by a magnetic field learner, which is obviously makes sense that if I apply a magnetic field strength is h c the extra energy that I am providing it is mu times h c square by 2 or b square by 2 mu whatever you want to talk about and uh, so therefore my difference in the Gibbs free energy is given by that expression. I can calculate the entropy from by differentiating the Gibbs free energy these are basic thermodynamics and what we find is there is a difference between the entropy of the normal state and the superconducting state and that quantity S n minus S s happens to be this minus it is just a differentiation of this quantity. So, therefore, since it is found that the critical field varies with temperature in such a way that dhc by dt is always negative, what we make a statement is this that superconducting state has a smaller entropy than a normal state. As you know entropy is a measure of the order, so therefore superconducting state is more ordered than a uh, normal state. Now, the other thing to notice is this that at t equal to Tc, at t equal to Tc, my Hc is equal to 0. So, my Sn is equal to S, that is, superconducting entropy is the same as the normal entropy. So, as a result, there is no latent heat at t equal to Tc. Since there is no latent heat, the order of transition is not first order transition. It turns out that the discontinuity in the specific heat shows that order of transition is a second order transition. Incidentally, most of all the phenomena that we know, the only example of a second order phase transition which is familiar to us is that of superconductivity. The water ice is a first order, water ice or boiling of water is a first order phase transition because there is a latent heat involved. This is a process where there is no latent heat involved, but the gradient of that it is discontinuous and as a result since specific heat is discontinuous I have that this is a second order phase transition. Okay. So, let us come to some other theory. Uh, first is uh, we will take uh, very elementary theories which was the one of the first to come in. This was known as London equations. London has nothing to do with the name of the city that but their name of two brothers who had uh, same surname obviously and uh, 
some Fritz London and some other London, their, their equation. Now, at that time, people did not understand much about why such a funny phenomena is occurring. So, what London, or actually I should say London's, they thought was that there are two types of electrons. Now, mind you, this is a purely phenomenological exercise. It has no microscopic basis. So, they said that, look, I am thinking, though we, we postulate, there are two different types of electrons in a material. One is known as superconducting electrons. Okay? There are two types of fluids. Okay? The, actually, it turns out the theory of superfluidity and superconducting, we have a lot of similarity. So, there is this type of fluid, which is called the superconducting electrons, and there is this normal electrons. The difference between them is that the normal electrons, when they travel through a material, they are subject to the usual resistance and things like that. But the superconducting electrons, they do not satisfy Ohm's law. So, see, so I assume that normal electrons are subjected to Ohm's law. Superconducting electrons, they move, but obviously they have to satisfy a force equation. So, for them, the ordinary Newton's law is valid. The, if there is an electric field, the simply mass times dv by dt is the charge times the electric field. So, what is what is what they do is what is shown here. That this here I plot electron density with temperature t. Now, the electron density normally does not vary very much with temperature t, there is a minor variation because when you increase the temperature, some extra conducting electrons may be available. But forget about that. But in this model, look at this dotted figure. So I start with at t equal to 0, certain number of superconducting electrons. And as the temperature reduces, the fraction of the superconducting electrons go on decreasing until at t equal to Tc, the superconducting electron density becomes 0. And the only electrons that I have now are the normal electrons and they are subject to of course resistance. This model has a lot of uh, you know I mean incorrect hypothesis about it because if you believe this it would mean that as in the superconducting state as long as temperature T is less than Tc its resistivity would depend upon how far it is from Tc and not what we find here that it is rigorously equal to uh, 0. Okay, so let us look, do a very simple arithmetic. So the arithmetic is this. I have my number density, which is simply n, n, n means normal, s is superconductor. This is actually a very trivial arithmetic. And by multiplying with the charge times the velocity, I get an expression which says the current density j consists of two parts. There is a normal current density and there is a superconducting current density. I have not put in vectors always, I have been careless. So, normal fluid is dissipated, which is, it satisfies Ohm's law. J n, J n is sigma e. J s does not satisfy that. Instead, what J s does, d j s by d t is d by d t of minus n times v s. There is a electronic charge missing there, which I think I brought back here. Okay? So, it is minus n e d by dt of v. Okay? And uh, so, this is dv by dt. Mass times dv by dt would be the force on it. So, this is what I have written down that, so this is equal to n s minus e and another minus e makes it e square. Okay? And I need a divided by m because it is dv by dt not dp by dt. So, therefore, divided by m times e. So, this gives me that electric field is given by d by dt of not just js, but some lambda times js, which is obtained by bringing that m and n s e square to this side. So, this is known as the first London's equation. Okay? Fortunately, there are two brothers, so they decided to have two equations there. Okay. So, let us go to second of the London's equation. Now, 
In order to do that, I go back to, it's very fortunate that I have just finished electromagnetism there because we keep on coming back to electromagnetism. So I again wrote down del cross E, e equal to minus dB by dt, but since I'm dealing with H vector, non-magnetic, so I write it as minus mu zero dH by dt. Okay. I just now said E is d by dt of lambda js, so this is what I have written down there and right hand side has remained the same. Recall that js is also del cross h, right? This is one of the Maxwell's equation, del cross b equal to mu 0 j, so del cross h is equal to js. So therefore, if I substitute for js del cross h, this equation becomes this capital lambda that I have written d by dt of del cross del cross up h equal to minus mu 0 dh by dt. Both the sides there is a d by dt there. So therefore the equation that I get is del cross del cross h is minus mu 0 by this capital lambda times h. In some sense we are at London equation. But if you now choose that look my del dot of h equal to 0 then I get into that this gives me an equation which is del square h equal to a constant which I have defined as 1 over this 1 over lambda square h which this lambda with a sub, subscript l is known as the London penetration depth. So this is the second London equation. Okay, this is what I did. I, I, I had del cross del cross h equal to minus 1 over lambda square h and so therefore uh, this is what happens. Now if you wanted to convert this into an equation in J, then reproduce for del cross h your J and this becomes that your J and the vector potential are linear with each other. This is, this is called London gauge, the divergence of A and the normal component of A become equal to 0. You need normal component of A equal to 0 because you do not want uh, any uh, current to flow through across the superconducting boundary to normal state. All right. So I've got an equation. Now let me give you an example of how this equation helps us in understanding Meissner effect. So notice this, that the equation that I gave you was this, del square h equal to 1 over lambda square h. The geometry that I have given here is the following, that consider a material, superconducting material, with which occupies the entire semi-infinite region x greater than 0. In other words, x equal to 0 is its boundary, surface, and it extends all the way to infinity. And then I have applied a magnetic field in the z direction. This is the geometry, the cross section of this uh, slab is perpendicular to the plane of the black x direction perpendicular to x direction. The magnetic field is in the direction, outward direction. Now in that case, because the material is semi-infinite, the only variation that can happen has to happen in the x direction. Because y direction and z direction, there is no variation possible. So therefore, my del square h can be essentially written as a d square h by dx square because that is the only direction in which h can vary. So therefore, the, this equation becomes d square h by dx square equal to 1 over lambda square h. Solution of this equation is very simple, h of x equal to h0 e to the power minus x by lambda. So in other words, if the field at x equal to 0 is h0, then the magnetic field strength, as you get through a distance of lambda, which has been calculated earlier, becomes 1 over e of its value. And I have told you several times this 1 over e keeps on coming. Because that always is a measure of how far a field penetrates. Okay? This happens whether, whether you are calculating the skin depth in a metal or whatever. So therefore, according to London, 
there is a quantity, there is a distance lambda after which the magnetic field or magnetic flux is effectively screened. Magnetic flux is effectively screened. So, this depth to which the magnetic field penetrates inside the sample is what is known as the London penetration depth. And mind you that I can actually calculate this because everything there is known to me. Okay? And compare it against uh, these. The typical penetration depth as one sees in the samples as is given here that is about for aluminum it is about 500 angstrom and it is a very small depth to which the field effectively penetrates. I would be just discussing BCS theory in a very qualitative way because Firstly, BCS theory is not something which you can teach to your students at that level. Secondly, BCS theory requires understanding of many body theory in order to work it out. But so therefore, I will just give you a few uh, pointers. The BCS theory assumes, very interesting, there is an attractive interaction between the electrons. Now, obviously, you say that that is nonsense. Electrons are similar charges and they must be subject to Coulomb's repulsion. But there is a problem that this is not the direct Coulomb repulsion. So, the way it happens is that when an electron enters let us say metal, now this electron also sees ions in it. Now, the electrons are typically traveling with velocities of the order of Fermi velocities. Now, when the electron gets in, the ion polarizes. Now, ion will polarize, but by the time ion has actually woken up to the fact that there is an electron nearby, by that time, because of the high velocity of the electron, the electron has run away. But the typical response time for the ion to realize that the electron has gone away is somewhat larger. We are still talking about small time scales, but basically it is something like this, bad example, but somebody comes, hits you and runs away. By the time you have realized you have been hit, you are still having a little bit of a pain. So, so that pain is still continuing on the ions. But at that stage, if another electron comes, it finds an ion already polarized. See, the previously, the job of the electron that came in was to polarize the ion, which it did, but it did not experience any effect of it. It ran away because it is moving away very fast. But another electron which has now come in, it finds an elect the ion to be already polarized and because it has a positive charge, it can reduce its energy using the positive charge cloud of the ion. So, effective result of this thing would be that because of the presence of the ions, my two electrons which we are talking about now have an effective attractive interaction. You see it is something like this. The attraction is not because the electron is attracted to the ion which it is, but electron one is attracted to the ion the same ion attracts the electron too. So, this results, this if you work it out, results in an effective interaction which shows that the two electrons have an attractive thing. And if this strength overcomes the direct Coulomb repulsion, then we will have a net attraction between the electrons which are, well, net attraction between the electrons. Now, what is the thing? Why did we bring up? the question of uh, indirect interaction. Indirect interaction because it is electron electron interaction which is normally repulsive, but it is an electron electron interaction mediated by phonons, the ionic motion. So, electron interacts with ion, ion interacts with another electron. As a result, the two electrons have a resultant uh, this interaction. The role of the ion was actually realized long back. Yeah. 
Yes. Sir, uh, if if the second electron comes yeah. before before the ion uh, ion you know feels the effect of the first one. Right. Uh, so it gets attracted. Why it stops at two? I mean, if the third. No, 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 no. We are just at this moment saying that suppose our world had two electrons only. BCS will bring in more electrons. Okay, but but it is a pairing mechanism which the BCS takes. The see the point is that if you bring in more and more electrons, it is not very clear that the Coulomb repulsion, the number which is going on increasing, can be overcome effectively. But the ion is still the same. So. The, and in any case, three body interactions are always known to be either non-existent or they are extremely weak. So we are talking about electron-electron interaction mediated by a phonon. And that is effectively why I am doing that, I am coming to in a second. Okay? So what is it that I want? Now, and why did I bring in that? That is the next question. One of the properties that was known about superconductors from the beginning was that if you took isotope of the same material, different isotopes of the same material, then you found out what is the variation of the critical temperature with isotopic mass. Normally you don't expect the critical temperature to depend upon isotopic mass because isotopic mass means more neutrons. So neutrons being charged neutral objects, you don't expect them to have any role in the whole business. But however, because of the fact that Tc, this is known as isotope effect, because of the fact that Tc is known to go as 1 over square root of m, I believe it is square root of m, I have probably written it wrongly, right? Anybody remembers it? 1 over square root of m, okay. Uh, yeah, this sort of, uh, the more looking at it, I realize I must have made a mistake. Yeah, but, but that is not important, what power appears? What is important is, in the process, the mass of an ion came into the picture. So in other words, ion is playing a role in the superconducting process. Now, this incidentally was the PhD topic of a young man known as Cooper. Cooper did the following problem. In fact, I would urge all of you to read Cooper's paper and I will tell you why. It's such a simple paper, okay, that all of you will be able to understand it without any help from anybody. And the paper goes like this. What he did is this. He said, suppose I have a field for me C, right? This is something which you know that I have a conductor with a background of field, field for me C. And suppose I put in two electrons in the background of two for me C's. Now, where does the Fermi C come into the picture? You see, field Fermi C means the states there are not available to another electron to be occupied. It's a field C. So he says that suppose I put two electrons there. Normally, what would happen? The electrons would occupy an energy higher than the top of the uh, Fermi C. Right? I mean, or they will go to the conduction band and things like that. But he said, that suppose I gave it an attractive interaction. And his paper makes it very clear, I don't care how weak that attractive interaction is, as long as the interaction is attractive. What he found is, that if the attraction is there between the two electrons, put in the background of field Fermi C, the Fermi C becomes unstable with respect to the two electrons. In other words, the two electrons actually have a bound state which has an energy lower than the Fermi energy. Remember that bound states are not scattering states, so they are in different things. And he worked it out. He worked it out, you know, with a very trivial, uh, ordinary Schrodinger equation, not a very difficult one, two electrons with an attractive interaction. What he did is this. I am not going to work it out, but I will show you what happened. So he said that supposing R1 and R2 are the coordinates of these two, he expanded the wave function in terms of the momentum of both. And then he went over to a center of mass frame so that you had total momentum and the relative momentum. Now, since he is trying to minimize energy, 
He says, I will choose only those solutions for which the total momentum is zero. Now, if you do that, then the wave function that he wrote down can be written like this. Sum over k, all possible values, uk e to the power ik dot r1 minus r2. This is purely written in the relative coordinates and relative momentum. Now, let us examine that wave function. Now, suppose I split this wave function into two. One for which uk is even in k. Suppose u minus k equal to uk. And another part for which it's odd, namely u minus k equal to minus uk. Then you realize if uk is even, then this exponential will give me cosine function. uk and u minus k, they are the same. So I will have the two terms and I will get cosine k dot r1 minus r2. On the other hand, if uk is odd, then of course I have e to the power ik dot r minus r1 minus e to the power minus ik, so I get sine function. Now if two electrons are to be in the same point in space, then their wave function cannot be the sine function because sine k dot r1 minus r2 when r1 is equal to r2 is 0. So therefore, this space part of the wave function has to be an even function. Even function meaning thereby symmetric function. It has to be k dot r1, the uh, cos cosine k dot r1 minus r2. So if you interchange r1 and r2, the function does not change. As you know that the total wave function is a product of the space part of the wave function and the spin part of the if the space part of the wave function is known to be even, symmetric, then the spin part of the wave function must be antisymmetric because the total product wave function must be antisymmetric. So what he did is to say he has a pair of electrons whose wave function the space part is symmetric and they form a singlet. Singlet is s equal to 0, which is known to be an antisymmetric function. So this is this is what this is what is known as Cooper pairs. So Cooper pairs are basically pairs of electrons which always are together. They have opposite spin polarity. And what the BCS theory does? is basically to look at it as a collection of Cooper pairs. He, because he has many more, so therefore he would need a many body theory for that. So this is the basic idea. I thought the Cooper pair can be talked about. BCS theory becomes a little more difficult to work and it certainly a lot more time taking is BCS theory itself used normally takes one or two lectures. So I couldn't do that. Okay. The last thing that I will do. Any question till now? Yeah. As far as I understand, basically phonon, this is phonon mediated right. interaction. Okay. Right. So phonon is the entire latized quantized energy. Yes. So you are, you are talking about the atom or the ion, yeah. which is uh, playing the important role. So That's the same thing actually. Oh. So the thing is this, that the lattice vibrations, which are basically ionic vibrations, okay, when they are quantized, they are called photons. Okay. So I brought in the presence of an ion, all right? But what makes them couple? Whether it is vibrating or not is a different matter. Okay. okay? What I am saying is, how does photon and phonon enter into the picture? So in order to do that, I said that how does ion enter into the picture to start with? is the vibration of the ions which will give rise to normal modes. The classically, there will be normal modes of vibration. Yeah. When you quantize them, they are your phonon. So, so there is no difference means. between what you are saying and I am saying. Yeah. I am simply saying that you need the presence of the ions. Hmm. 
right am i making sense okay okay yeah. so is it like that uh, upper pair formation is nothing but it is the pair of electrons with opposites in y polar the electrons which are there whose interaction is mediated by the presence of phonons okay basically the way it happens is okay bad example but let me tell you this that supposing we are playing a uh, ball passing game now i send a ball to you you send a ball to him right now he doesn't ever send it he talks to you you talk to me but in the process the communication we are bound because i can't get away now okay so this is the effect that because you have in our in fact the picture is essentially that what you find is that between an electron and a phonon there is an interaction which will be shown okay you must have seen those diagrams and then between the phonon and another electron there will be another spring type of thing shown there but the effect is to bind these two people together sir yeah generally those are very good conductor at room temperature is not superconductor because cooper pair formation is not possible and those having a not good conductor at the room temperature might be a superconductor so what is the fundamental difference why cooper pair formation come, is not did you come a little late to this session i had made one announcement right in the beginning i said high temperature superconductors i don't understand okay in fact very few people understand it the theories are not yet standard okay and the theory that is applicable to the current cuprite super, uh, superconductors are not bcs type is not a cooper pair type people have tried to do it but they have not succeeded there are other types of theories that are coming out now okay the um, the so therefore that is one question which it's not that i cannot give you a uh, sort of a some sort of a guess but it would certainly not be correct for the simple reason theoretically the high temperature superconductor though there are hell of a lot of experimental evidences the theory wise they are not yet as good that is why it is good to say what i am discussing today is connected with conventional superconductors which typically are superconducting and that too i have mostly talked about type 1 in type 1 temperatures i think the maximum is about 9 degrees kelvin or so type 2 conventional superconductors is about 23 degrees of that order but what you are talking about are much higher temperature superconductors so i i don't know the answer to that question the ions you know electrons uh, are coming and striking that one where do you find is i don't have a liquid where did you find negative ions in a solid the electron electron attracts them yes that electron is coming and it strikes on an ion and that ion may be positive or negative or both so where will you find a negative ion inside a solid you know ions are positive and negative both you know sorry sorry sir you are you i use the word ions to indicate the structure of positive ions that are there in a solid ions that you are talking about are different you are talking thinking in terms of something like a sodium chloride chloride salt or things like that no we are talk see there are electrons what is the structure of a solid i have positive charges my ions are positively charged no so accordingly not, you second electron changes its charge from charge cloud you know you, you told that i said that it polarizes it. yeah polarize that one it polarizes that and we have seen the polarization affects the electric field correct ion is polarized that ion is polarized ion is polarized ion is polarized now once the ion is polarized it would have normally affected that electron yeah but that electron because of its high speed has already gone away and that becomes phonon perhaps the electron after uh, collision phonon, phonon is the vibration of the ion the after 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 interaction yeah. the electron that we get or the particle that we uh, that we get yeah. that is also called as phonon you know no phonons are lattice vibrations only it has no no connection with electrons okay phonons are just just quantized name of lattice vibration and when you say lattice vibration you mean the vibration of the ions the massive ones and because they are massive ones they are lot more sluggish okay okay thank you the last thing that i want to do talk about is a very interesting property it's called josephson effect and i'm talking about it because it has become very important technical device these days 
So the Josephson effect takes place in the following way that imagine a thin layer of insulator sandwiched between two superconductors on either side. Okay? Now, if the thickness of the insulator is small, because of the spread, the fact that the wave function of the superconductor spreads a little bit, what you can find is there can be a tunneling of the type that you have already done from one side to another. Now, but this is a very interesting thing. The interesting thing is that if you have such a material system sandwich connected with the wires on the outside, don't apply any voltage. Don't apply any voltage. You find that in the presence of a zero voltage, there is still a current. Now that can happen provided this system is acting like a battery. That is, electrons from one side is penetrating through the insulating section and going to the other side and completing a circuit. Now that is called DC Josephson effect. Now more interesting thing happens when you apply a DC voltage. If you apply a DC voltage, what you find is that the current starts oscillating. You don't expect that, right? You apply a DC voltage, you don't expect the current to oscillate. That's called AC Josephson effect. So let us look at the theory I'm giving you is not a rigorous quantum mechanical derivation, but this was worked out by Feynman and you can still find it if you people have the Feynman's, I believe there is a second volume or third volume has a chapter which says a seminar on superconductivity. Anybody remembers? Having, anybody has seen it? You have seen it. Where, where is it? Is it in the electrodynamics section or in the quantum mechanics book? Volume 3, okay. The, so it's in the quantum mechanics part. Title of that chapter is a seminar on superconductivity. Please read it. Because only a teacher like that could have given you this type of a derivation, which is very interesting. He said, all right, let us look at that problem. Now look, look at it. Supposing I denote the wave function on one side with a psi 1 and the other side with psi 2. Now, I want to write down what is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So it is ih cross d psi by dt is equal to the Hamiltonian. But where is my Hamiltonian? Okay, My Hamiltonian is just because of the fact that there is a coupling term which couples me to the other side. I have told you it is not rigorous, but it is very interesting. So what he does is to say that there is a coupling strength which he writes as h cross t. t is coupling. And he says this coupling strength is related to the wave function on the second side. So i h cross d psi 1 by dt is t times psi 2. And likewise, i h cross d psi 1, 2 by dt is the coupling strength times psi 1. The coupling has to be symmetric. Now look at these two equations. And now remember that these wave functions are very gross wave function. In the sense, the uh, so what is a wave function? I know that psi star psi is basically a probability density. So I write down psi as square root of n1 times a phase factor, right? Wave function has a amplitude part and a phase part and the amplitude has to be square root of the density. So this is what we did. Psi 1 is square root of n1 e to the power i theta 1. Psi 2 is square root of n2 e to the power i theta. Substitute this there. Substitute it there and uh, uh, write down this. Remember that both n and theta can vary with time. So when you put it there, d by dt of this, there is a d by dt of square root of n, which gives you half 1 over square root of n, and then there is a term d theta by dt. So if you trust my algebra, then this is what I get. I get d psi 1 by dt equal to half square root of n1 e to the power i theta 1. So this is what I get, these two equations. 
After that, just do some arithmetic with this. Multiply the first one by this, second one by this, you find equations of this type. 1 by 2 dn1 by dt plus in1. So this is the equation that I get and you will find that there will be a phase difference theta 2 minus theta 1 will come in. Now what we do is this. We say write down this equation, separate their real and imaginary part. The arithmetic or the mathematics that Feynman has given is to be seen to be believed that you can get as complicated things as Josephson junction by almost doing very trivial arithmetic. So these equations on separating real and imaginary part become like this. Now look at this. The only way this has come in now is dn1 by dt is proportional to root n1 n2 sin delta and dn2 by dt is minus that. That has to happen because if there is an increase in the density on one side, that has to lead to decrease in the density on the other side and it is n which is connected with the current. So therefore, I get an expression of this type. Supposing my n1 and n2 are approximately the same, I find that my current which is related to n1 minus n2 goes as j equal to j0 sin delta. Now remember, delta is a constant. So there is no time variation there. So I have a DC current due to the fact that I have simply connected by a wire, there is no source of voltage. I can repeat this calculation by putting in a voltage storm. And that's again very easy to do. Because what he does there is to say, all right, go back to these equations again. And now, in addition to this term, put a voltage term, V psi, appropriately dimensioned. Now, if you do that, then what you find is the following. You find that the current, which was earlier J naught sine delta, that gets this expression. But now the time enters the phase factor. So as a result, the current oscillates. That's called AC Josephson effect. OK? Any question? Any doubts? Yeah. No, 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 no. Capital T is the coupling constant between the two sides. See, you have you are writing down what is I h cross d psi 1 by dt. Now that has to be the that's equal to the Hamiltonian of that. So therefore, what we are saying is the uh, h psi equal to e psi. So I am saying that that is equal to t times psi 2. So it's an energy unit. It's an energy unit. I mean, yeah. yeah. Because at zero degree Kelvin, phonons are absent. Yeah. So superconductivity will be absent in the material at zero degree Kelvin. Remember, I sort of told you that the one doesn't talk about what happens at zero degree Kelvin because of the third law. Okay. Entropy of everything, whether it is normal state or the superconducting state, everything will go to zero. Okay. So zero degree Kelvin is not something that we talk about. Because even the normal state is still ordered. That's the only state I have. Okay, thank you very much.